Our New Testament reading and preaching text comes from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. 1 Peter 2, 4 through 10. Come to Jesus, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in Him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, He is precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner. And the stone that makes them stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you were not received once you had not received mercy but now you have received mercy this is the word of the lord so it's very common for pastors or bible study teachers or anybody like that to get questions about how we understand the old testament and the new testament together they ask things like how do we understand what seem like differences They also ask, is God the same in both of these? Because sometimes it looks like he's not. Today's text invites us into one of those questions about how we understand both the Old Testament and the New Testament together. One of the biggest differences between these two uh, sets of books is that the Old Testament tends to focus on the story of God's work with one nation, the Israelites. We shouldn't believe that God is only working with these people, as there are many examples in the Old Testament where God was doing things outside of that group. And there's also a lot of hints in the Old Testament that God was doing even more than we could see. But as we get into the New Testament, God reveals that his work is beyond any single group of people. God's work impacts and is to all of humanity. We are continuing our sermon series uh, entitled, What is the Church? And this week we're going to be considering how a new understanding of how God works in the world and the nature of Jesus fit into the church's calling as we see it in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, God had this special relationship with the nation of Israel. And although they moved around a lot, they tied their faith and who they were to a place. The most important of those places was Jerusalem where the temple resided, which could kind of, if we try to think of it in light of how we understand things, would be kind of like the head church or something like that. But when Jesus came, it changed everything. Jesus did what Israel never could. He lived a perfect, righteous example. And he demonstrated that God had a bigger plan than could be limited to any single place or any single people group. But you see, Israel had a lot of expectations that they needed help releasing. And we are in one of those texts today where the Apostle Peter is helping the young church undo some of these incorrect expectations that they had. He's inviting them to release their connection of God to a place. Peter is also inviting people to put their trust in Jesus, who he refers to as a living stone. Now there is a lot going on with this stone metaphor that Peter uses. There are several Old Testament passages that refer to the coming Messiah 
as an important stone in a building project. They would have been familiar with talking about the Messiah as an important piece of a building. But as our Old Testament reading pointed out, there was also an expectation that the Messiah was going to be building a great temple for God. If you followed that as Fred read it, there was this um, thing that comes through that, okay, is that partially David's real son or is there an expectation for more than that? Not everything could fit into the life of a human. It just kind of leaves something unsettled in that. There's also a play on words that's going on between stone and sun. Just like the English language, in Hebrew, stone and sun share several of the same letters. And so when they're talking about stone and sometimes talking about sun, they're playing with both, kind of having us wrestle with who exactly are you talking about? And eventually, the church will get to the point where they realize Only Jesus fits all of this. The writers of our Bible and Jesus himself use this closeness to play with this concept that the promised one, the coming Messiah, would build something new. And to this group that Peter is addressing, he is saying that Jesus is doing exactly that. He's building a place that isn't dependent on geography or even on a building. Jesus is using one pe- isn't using one people group as special over any other. He's building a spiritual house upon himself. This is the church. And it is only dependent on him. And we are invited to be part of that church. Now as we struggle with COVID-19, I want you to think what it means to be part of this spiritual house that Jesus has established. No longer will we be limited by geography. Hear me clearly. That does not mean that a place can't be special. I hope this room that we are in right now has been a special place where Jesus has impacted you. I've only been here eight months And already this place has become special to me. It was even special when hardly anybody else was here. It's a lot better now. But even at that time, this was a special place. But I can't wait for the day when we can all walk through these doors without any restrictions, without any fear of the pandemic. And by the way, when we do that, we are going to do some serious celebration. We are going to have some fun. We are going to have some parties. We are going to thank Jesus and we are going to celebrate. But even now when we are physically limited, the kingdom that Jesus is establishing is not limited or restricted in any way. Its form has no limits because it is completely dependent on Jesus, the one himself, who has no limits. And we see this in church history. Uh, um, There has always been this desire in church history of having some capital of Christianity. You know, some other religions, they have one single place and that's their capital. Christianity has never been able to do that. And I think that's part of what Jesus is telling us um, in this passage. Um, For a while it was Jerusalem, and then it was Alexandria, and then it was Constantinople, and then Rome, and then maybe America in some way for a while, and then now, where would you put the capital of Christianity? South Korea would be a good argument. Many of the African countries could be a possibility, but none of them ever stick, and I think they don't, because Christianity at its core constantly says there is no one place or one people, that Jesus is doing this broad, big thing, and it is never limited in any way. It is completely okay if you are uh, dealing heavily with these restrictions we've had in the church, if they have bothered you, if they've even brought you to tears, I know that with many of us, the problems have been severe. But as we mourn, 
we can also be inspired. Israel always struggled with thinking that God's plan was limited to them. Jesus' life and ministry dem demonstrated that God's plan was far broader than they ever imagined. That while God did have a special relationship with them, it, his relationship wasn't limited to them. God is inviting us into something that isn't limited by anything. It is something that will never be torn down or destroyed. We, us people, are the church. Not any building or residence, but if everything that was dependent on us, it could still come to an end. God's kingdom is not limited to geography or even by the people God is calling. It is always moving forward, and the church will always face challenges and hardships, but it will never be defeated. Because it isn't based on us. It is based on Jesus. Whose very relationship to humanity is described in a very special stone. What kind of stone would that be? So I always knew this day would happen. Um, Vicki always does her research really well. Does a good job. But um, different commentators go different ways on what exact stone, what kind of a stone that could that this could be and the cornerstone like she was talking is one real possibility the other possibility of a stone is the stone that is the centerpiece of an arch of a building the one that all the weight goes on to that supports all the others either of these stones could fit uh, with the Hebrew word that is being used so I knew the day would come where I would lean towards one and Vicky would lean towards another and we'd go different ways, but either one is uh, likely. This stone that holds all the others together in the arch is the one that all of these stones depend on. If it doesn't do its job, if it doesn't fit exactly right, nothing else will hold. Peter is explaining likely to a Jewish and Gentile congregation that God is doing this, that God is building his house in this way, based on Jesus alone. It doesn't really rely on something or someone else to support it or sustain it, and it is a spiritual rather than a physical kingdom. And he's also still, uh, he is also stating that this stone not only draws and supports, but it causes some to stumble. This description of Jesus as the one that causes uh, some to stumble is prevalent throughout Scripture. Uh, just as strongly as people are drawn to Jesus, others are repelled by who he is. And for most of us, this is not our favorite description or understanding of Jesus in the Bible, but this is one that comes up with God and people over and over again, and it's one we have to consider. In the books of the Bible known as the Gospels, the religious elite are disgusted by who Jesus is and what he stands for. And you can even make the argument that they had a better understanding of what Jesus was claiming than a lot of his disciples did. And once they understood how it was going to be, they couldn't stand it. And they not only uh, resisted it, they tried to make it go away. They tried to repress it. But I think one thing that's really important for us today is to not read this as just an us and them thing. Of We're the ones supported by Jesus. They're the ones who are not supported by Jesus. Another powerful way is to look at ourselves and say, what parts of us are open to Jesus' support? And what parts of us say, Jesus, now you better be exactly like this. You better function in this way. It's far too easy to glide over these kinds of verses and put it in this them and me situation. Jesus is like a stone. And this stone has two identities. It is the support. It is the cornerstone. But it is also the stone that causes us and others to stumble. 
You know, the longer and the deeper we follow Jesus, the more we realize Jesus and I are a whole lot different. You know, if Jesus always uh, yeah, tends to be the way uh, you are or Jesus tends to be the way I am, if Jesus likes the things that I like, likes the people I like, doesn't like the people I don't like, doesn't like the things I don't like, the question is, are we really hearing Jesus or have we made Jesus' voice our own? Perhaps no one saw Jesus closer than the Pharisees. And when they demanded that Jesus be a certain way that he never could have been, they said he can't be like this. These stumbling blocks are supposed to be things that help us see Jesus, that draw us to Jesus. But for some, they become a permanent block because they don't allow them to see Jesus really. How many times when you read through the Gospels do you see the Pharisees work everything out, make it clear, and say it can't be like this? But we have been called out of darkness into a marvelous light to proclaim Jesus' mighty acts. He has done great things and we need to tell the world about it. What all of this means is, whatever our situation is, whatever problem we are facing, whether it's COVID-19 or anything we've faced in the past or anything we as the church will face in the future, that doesn't limit the church because the church is based on who Jesus is and what Jesus is about, and it is always only dependent on him. You know, people regularly ask me in this time, you know, I hope we do this thing in the coming year. I hope we're able to do that thing. And I always, I kind of feel bad about it because, you know what, I don't know. I don't know what we're going to be able to do as we move forward. But what I do know is this. That God in the flesh is in the process of setting up a spiritual kingdom where he invites us to himself, where we are empowered and not limited because it isn't based on us. It is based on the rock that is Jesus that is never fallen, never discarded. It always uh, rings true and fits. Nothing limits Jesus. And a main component of his plan is to use his church no matter what they are going through at the time, even if it is a pandemic. Let us pray. Loving God, you are the rejected one who now has become the cornerstone. You care for all of humanity, holding everything together. Build us into your spiritual house. Hold together those things that you want to see advance and make what needs to disappear stumble. We lift up the training center in Esteli, Nicaragua. We praise you for the 140 graduates and the 140 new students that began their training. Use their work to make a difference in their country and the world. We pray for those in our congregation and beyond that suffer. Help them to find peace in you. We ask for your mercy with COVID-19. Bring its time to an end. Redeem what is lost. Use us for the glory of your realm and the good of your people. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Join us at First Presbyterian Church Sundays at 11 a.m. in our sanctuary or live streamed on our website. Or watch us on My 11 every Sunday morning at 9.